This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Sometimes auditors have to gather evidence through putting reliance on the opinions and reports of third parties. For example, experts are needed in the valuation of land and buildings. You can't expect the auditor to be able to look at the property portfolio of a client and decide on the market prices. This is outside an auditor's expertise. Uh, similarly, actuaries. Actuaries are used to value the pension liabilities versus a pension fund that uh, companies have and can advise whether or not the company needs to put more money into the pension fund. Lawyers are consulted to give some indication of whether or not a lawsuit is going to be won or lost by the client. And again, this would be outside the expertise, really, of the auditors. Internal auditors are sometimes relied on to do part of the audit work. Internal auditors are uh, very involved, really, in looking at the system of internal controls in evaluating that, and they can do a lot of this procedural work uh, instead of the um, external auditors. Similarly, uh, the internal auditors are often asked if they could maybe audit you know, 12 out of the 15 branches, uh, whereas the external auditor will visit three of the branches each year, changing as you, as you go round. Greatly reducing the cost of the audit, really, for the client, uh, and also maybe making it more efficient, because the internal auditors are experts in that particular business, rather than travelling around lots of different businesses, as the external auditors do. And sometimes external auditors have to rely on other external auditors. If you're a holding company audited by one auditor, the subsidiary company audited by another, they come to consolidate these results, then the auditor of the holding company in the group is putting some reliance on the audit work that has been done by the subsidiary auditor. Whatever the sort of third party, it's essential that the auditors make sure that these third parties are properly, professionally qualified. Uh, if they're not professionally qualified, how could we possibly put any sort of reliance on what they might be saying? Secondly, they have to be appropriately experienced. Uh, if uh, the client had a, a list of domestic properties, flats and houses, there's no point in getting in a valuer who is an expert in commercial properties, offices and factories. They may both be having professional qualifications in valuing buildings, but really their experience is, is, is not the right experience for that particular uh, sector of the market. We want them to be independent. Uh, if, again, we take our property company and our client use one particular estate agent for all the buying and selling transactions, there'd be pressure on this estate agent uh, perhaps to value the properties in a way uh, that the client wants. Otherwise, the client would say, you know, put up the value a little bit, or maybe you're going to get no more work from me. And finally, they have to be professional. Uh, we have a proper professional company, not just somebody kind of uh, acting uh, out of the front room, so to speak, uh, a proper firm with a good reputation. When we're relying on third parties, we need to, to do the following. Uh, we need to agree exactly what work they are to do. What are they to value? Uh, and also, by when are they to value it? Because most audits are working towards a deadline. We must make sure we know exactly what we're doing and what they're doing. We must say, well, we'll look at these three branches. You look at those 12 branches. That's all 15 branches covered. You don't want any gaps or overlaps. We need to think about the nature, scope and timing of communications, exactly what do we want them to say on their report and by when do we need it. And finally, it's important that uh, the expert observes confidentiality. These experts are going into your client company, they're seeing all sorts of interesting information, like the value of the properties held by that company. Uh, they're going in and maybe assessing whether or not the company's going to win a lot of money on a law case, lose a lot of money in a law case. This will undoubtedly affect the profit of the company, perhaps, or the share price of the company. 
uh, and that information was leaked, then you could giving advantages to other investors. Just because you are relying on a well-qualified, experienced, professional expert doesn't let the auditor off the hook. At the end of the day, it is the auditor who is signing the audit report saying, in my opinion, the financial statements give a true and fair view, and you can't just escape it responsibility by saying, well, they're the ones who valued it. So you're always kind of picking away at it, it's always kind of uh, fighting it, always wrestling with these experts' opinions, just to see if they stand up to scrutiny. So, for example, consistency uh, with other evidence. So, if you know that over the last year, property prices have gone up 10% in general, and this is the sort of information which tends to be known about economies, uh, and the valuation of the properties of your client have gone down by 5%, then there's a peculiar discrepancy, and you would be expected to raise this with the valuer. Assumptions made. Uh, assumptions made, for example, in pension fund valuations, there's always an assumption that has to be made about the rate of growth of the pension fund. Uh, if it's mostly in the stock exchange, do we think the stock exchange values are going to grow by you know, 3% per annum, 5% per annum, 10% per annum? Because these difference of assumptions makes huge differences to the adequacy of the fund. And finally, the use and uh, accuracy of the source data. So if we're getting our uh, valuer, property valuer, to value the fi, you know, to value the properties that the company owns at the end of the year, make sure they have the right list. Make sure that list that you give them has been updated for all properties bought during the year, uh, and has all properties sold during the, the year uh, has been removed. Or if you're going and looking at again the pension fund uh, adequacy, uh, make sure that we have updated them with the number of staff we now have and their ages and so on. Uh, and this is something we, we can we can look at. We don't have to know what to do with the age of people and, and so on, but at least make sure that the uh, independent expert is starting off with the right source data. Getting back just a little bit to internal audit, we haven't mentioned it very much yet. Uh, internal auditors, we said very, very useful in companies. It's a, uh, a form of internal control which the uh, company under corporate governance is, is supposed to keep under review. You don't have to have them. But if you do have them, uh, you want them really to be uh, reporting to the audit committee. These internal auditors are employees of the company. And if you don't have an internal audit committee, have got an audit committee, uh, the people, the person they're probably going to be reporting to is a finance director. And of course, it is the finance director who is responsible maybe for the system of internal control or the finance director who is responsible for errors in the financial statements. So here you have relatively junior employees reporting to the finance director, reporting maybe to errors or shortcomings that this finance director has made. And that's a pretty uncomfortable sort of position to be in. Uh, particularly if it's a finance director you go to see every year to have your annual appraisal and your pay increases. So the audit committee, this uh, uh, subcommittee of non-executive directors gives much greater power and independence to the internal auditors. They help in the achievement of corporate objectives. Part of the achievement of corporate objectives is ensuring that there is a good system of internal control. You have little hope of achieving your objectives if you don't know what's going on in the company and you can't rely on management accounts or financial statements. They should be uh, helpful at uh, assessing risk and its management. We said one element of the internal controls is risk assessment. You keep your eyes open to see where things might go wrong or have gone wrong, uh, and you invent new controls, design new controls to kind of plug those gaps. They design the internal control system, and they will check its operation. They will do a lot of this procedural audit 
of you know, picking out five invoices, ten invoices, fifty invoices. Very often internal auditors can go up in the volume, let's say fifty invoices, making sure all of these invoices have been properly authorized, whatever other procedure they're trying to, to test. They're very often involved in uh, special investigations. If the company discovers a fraud, then you want to know how long has it been going on for, how much money have we lost, who's involved, how can we stop it. Uh, and you want to do this kind of really quite quickly. So these internal auditors can be taken off their ordinary work and kind of drafted in to really hammer this issue of fraud as quickly as possible to stop it and to find those who are responsible. Value for money audits. There may be a question, should we keep certain procedures in-house or should we subcontract them? Should we maybe subcontract the uh, maintenance of the receivables ledger to a factor? Maybe they could do it at a better price and better. They'll test IT controls. You know, is there a virus checker in there? Is the firewall work, uh, working? Do we regularly change passwords? Are we taking backups properly? Uh, what happens if I put silly data into the system? Is this going to break the system and uh, make it go out for a couple of hours? And as I've said, very importantly, liaising with external auditors and sharing the work so that the uh, audit will be cheaper and it can be done more quickly and effectively. I must say in this that again the external auditors can't just shift off responsibility to the internal auditors. It is absolutely essential that the work done by the internal auditors is reviewed by the external auditors. They can see what work has been done, they can see if it's been done professionally, they can see what the, ex, the internal auditors have done if they find some kind of a problem. Uh, this work done by the internal auditors has to be of a high standard and it is up to the external auditors to ensure that that is the case.